Good morning, everyone, and welcome to the worship service for the Gathering United Methodist Church. I'd like to begin by reading to you from Psalm 111. Praise the Lord. I thank the Lord with all my heart in the company of those who do right in the congregation. The works of the Lord are magnificent. They are treasured by all who desire them. God's deeds are majestic and glorious. God's righteousness stands forever. God is famous for his wondrous works. The Lord is full of mercy and compassion. Let us pray together. O oh God, we are in a time of year when we celebrate the fact that the Word has become flesh. And as we celebrate your presence among us, Lord, we realize there are many things for which to be thankful and for which to offer you the praise. Help us, O oh God, as we worship to remember these things and your mercy and your compassion. Amen. Christ is the world's light, Christ and none other, born in our darkness, he became our brother. If we have seen him, we have seen the Father, glory to God on high. Christ is the world's peace, Christ and none serve him and despise another who else unites us one in God the Father glory to God on high Christ is the world's life Christ and none other for silver, murdered here our brother. He who redeems us reigns with God the Father. Glory to God on high. Give God the glory, God and my brother, glory to God on high. My name's Judy Deer and we're at Cookson Hills uh, Center today in Cookson, Oklahoma. So right now we provide a meal for seniors Mondays and Wednesdays. And then uh, we open the doors at 10 so they have some time for social activity, they love to play bingo. And then uh, we have the thrift store where uh, we sell clothing, quite a bit of business there where people can come in and get clothing, you know, at a very uh, low cost. And then we have the gift shop where we buy uh, jewelry or beaded items or whatever the local native crafts people are making, we buy that from them so that we can sell them. I think that we provide a little bit of food out of our uh, thrift store, but the big thing will be to, to offer the food pantry. We do some things to try to support our ministries. We have the mat shop where we make the mats from uh, recycled tires. We have opportunities for teams. You can uh, stay a week long because we have a lodge that uh, you can stay overnight so you could stay here. I had one uh, older lady ask me, she said, I can't do much physically but I would like to come and help Cookson. And I said, well, you know, come and, and be with us. We can find something. There's always something around here that needs to be done. So we can find anything for you to participate and be a part of it because it's a collective effort. Friends, as you can see, the Cookson Hills ministry is one in which uh, many lives are touched 
and also in a very <clears throat> broad area. I've just jotted down a, a few things that I have learned as, as well. I've discovered that it is a ministry with persons in the area, uh, many of whom are uh, in poverty, uh, some of whom are indigenous to this area. We have learned that the three counties or three of the counties that surround them are some of the poorest counties in Oklahoma. So we know this is a much needed ministry. Persons can come to a thrift store or a pantry and have those kinds of needs served, or they can also engage in some of the ministries themselves that are happening there. And there are monies that come from the gift shop, from the, the mat shop. There are opportunities for seniors, for fellowship, for food, <clears throat> and for many, many more things. I know that they have coordinated with missions many times uh, because there are a lot of teams that go there. They have places where people can stay, uh, whether the mission is taking place over a weekend or maybe even like a week, week long. Um, and also there is many connections to the Oklahoma Indian Missionary Conference churches in that area and they collaborate with them in uh, several of their, of their ministries. So we want to be certain as we come to our time of prayer this morning that um, we include this ministry, this much needed ministry in our, in our prayers. As always, I also like to remember those whose churches have disaffiliated but they've chosen to remain United Methodist. We know that there are still persons who are grieving, who are working through decisions, and who are trying to sort many different kinds of things out in their lives. And we want to remember them in the hopes that in their um, isolation that they will not feel alone, that you will know that we are with you in prayer and in spirit, and that we will continue to guide you and help you as you make your journey. Let's pray together. O oh God, we thank you for the birth of your Son, Jesus Christ. And we know during this season, O oh God, that we celebrate that the Word has become flesh. Help us, Lord, to realize that the purpose of this time is for us to, to, to come to know that your presence and your life is real in our lives. Help us to know, Lord, that you can work in our lives and that we can see the evidence and the fruit of that work that you do. Help us also, Lord, to know that you can work through us as we serve you, that you can show up and be fruit and a redemptive presence in the lives of so many other people. So I pray, O oh God, that even though many of us have challenges, that even though sometimes we have problems, we have doubts, we have fears, that we would make this journey, O oh God, with hope in our hearts. Because we, we know, Lord, that your presence shows up among us, that the word has indeed become flesh, and that you have called us to be the sacramental presence of Jesus Christ in the world in which we live. O oh God, I pray that we will be faithful to you. I pray, O oh God, that we will be enduring and persevering when we have our doubts or when we cannot see you or when it feels like you are distant from us. Lord, I just pray that you'll continue to help us, Lord, to, to share the good news of Jesus Christ, of this Savior's birth, and to help others know that it is for them as well. I pray that as the church during these times that we can begin anew in this year and that we can find new life in our ministries and in the work <clears throat> and in the worship that, that we do. Lord, there are many persons on our hearts and minds this day, but we especially want to remember the Cooks and Hills ministries. We pray, O oh God, that their work would continue to reach out to many persons persons who are in poverty, persons who are indigenous to that area, and others, O oh God, who would come and be a part of that ministry and have their spirits renewed, who would find in a sense of identity and many different ways to serve in those areas. I thank you, O oh God, for um, the director and for the persons, the volunteers who work and who help, 
And I'd pray that each of us would hear a calling, O oh God, to support that ministry in a variety of, of different ways. Lord, we lift them up to you and just pray that they will continue to share God's love and that a difference will be made in people's lives. We also pray, O oh God, for persons whose churches have disaffiliated, but they've chosen to remain United Methodist. I ask God that you will be with them. I pray that as they have separated from their church, that they would know that they are not alone, that they are still a child of God, that you love them very much, and that you have a very important purpose for their life. Help them to know not only that you are not done with them yet, but that perhaps you can work in their life in greater ways. And that you will guide them as they consider next steps about places to go where they can worship, places to go where they can serve. Help them, Lord, and be with them. Lord, I pray for those who are ill. I pray for persons who are estranged, and I pray for persons who are feeling lonely. And I ask God that you would come and surround them and embrace them with your love. Help them to know, Lord, that you are by their side and that they can lean upon you for strength. And all these things we pray in the name of our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ, who taught us to pray, saying, Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread and forgive us our trespasses as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever. Amen. Brothers and sisters in Christ, our scripture lesson for today comes to us from the Gospel of Mark. I am still in the first chapter, beginning with verse 21 and going through verse 28. And as always, I invite you to listen for God's word. Jesus and his followers went into Capernaum. Immediately on the Sabbath, Jesus entered the synagogue and started teaching. The people were amazed by his teaching, for he was teaching them with authority, not like the legal experts. Suddenly, there in the synagogue, a person with an evil spirit screamed, What have you to do with us, Jesus of Nazareth? Have you come to destroy us? I know who you are. You are the Holy One from God. Silence, Jesus said, speaking harshly to the demon. Come out of him. The unclean spirit shook him and screamed. Then it came out. Everyone was shaken and questioned among themselves. What's this? A new teaching with authority. He commands unclean spirits and they obey him. Right away, the news about him spread throughout the entire region of Galilee. This is the word of God for the people of God. And let us join together in saying, thanks be to God. Friends, whenever we're talking about faith in Jesus Christ, have you ever asked yourself, on what do I base my words? The answer to that question pretty much reveals what your authority is. Now, a lot of times we confuse power and authority. We say, I have the authority to do this. I have the authority to that. But really we mean we have the power to do this. We have the power to do that. Authority is a little bit different thing. Authority is how you know what you know. And it's not just limited to knowledge. It also has to do with what you say and what you do. If I were to say, for example, that the Gospel of Mark was the very first gospel that was ever written, you would probably say something like, how do you know that? And then I would have to say, well, I have read three theologians and I have these five reasons for believing that that is true. But then you might say something like, well, I believe that the gospel of, of Matthew is the, is the first gospel that was ever written. And I have these three theologians and these five reasons why I think that is true. And of course, you and I would have to talk about that and decide and, and see what, what kind of conclusion that we might come up with. Folks, I'm not telling you this because I want us to talk today about which gospel was written first, but because I want to offer an understanding of what authority is because it's, our, it's the issue in our scripture lesson for today. The Bible says that Jesus taught as one having authority. In other words, Jesus preached without references and footnotes. When he spoke, it was as if 
God was speaking. And the Bible says that the people were astounded. Why? Because nobody had ever taught them like that before. Yes, they were taught by rabbis, they were taught by scribes, interpreted the law by Pharisees. Um, and, and the people depended on those because not only did people need to receive those teachings, but there weren't very many copies of the scriptures at that time. So sometimes the people just came and learned uh, based on what they heard the scriptures say to them as it was shared by those leaders. Now the Bible says that this is a new teaching. So what's new about it? Well, what's new about it is, is that the Word had become flesh. And now we were being taught directly by God. That's why people were amazed. If Jesus were right here with us today, speaking to us, I think we would still be amazed. And I also think that we can still be amazed because Jesus is present with us in the authority of the Bible. You see, when Jesus ascended this earth, his life and teachings did not come to an end. We know that in time, uh, those early believers began to organize themselves. They began to, to gather for worship. They served other people. They reached out to people that were in need. But among them was a group of people who decided to preserve the life and the teachings of Jesus. And the reason why they decided to do this is because there was a lot of false teachings at the time. People were taking Jesus' words and putting different meanings to it. People were taking philosophical concepts like that Jesus was not a human being, that he was more like a ghost. And they were saying that this is what Jesus was like. And so these preservers tried to write down as accurately as they possibly could. And they called them, in Greek, the euangelion, which means the good news. That's what they were trying to share with God's people. Now, sometime later in the second century, church leaders got together and they took all of the writings that they had and they tried to say what constitutes the Word of God. And they decided that there was 66 documents that did that, or, or books. There was 39 that composed what they would call the Old Testament and 27 that, what, as, that they would call the New Testament. And, that, and they called these things a canon. And the, and the word canon is a Latin word which meant measuring stick. The way I like to think of it is, is which books measured up to being the word of God. So these persons preserve these things. And today we can say the presence of God is with us because the word of God is with us. In fact, I would even say that the word of God is an epiphany because we can read the scriptures and we can see God at work in people's lives. We can hear parables and we can see ways that God is revealed to us. And we can hear God speaking to us in our own lives as well. It's not always something that's easy to ascertain. Sometimes we have to study a little bit. Sometimes we have to pray about it. Sometimes we have to ask God for discernment about the scriptures but it is still an epiphany. It is a way that God works in our, in our lives. Now, what exactly does that mean in our world? Well, the scripture also tells us that there was a man in the synagogue that day who was unclean, and scholars say that the uncleanliness describes this man's spirit as much as it does his appearance, although scholars do um, debate as to exactly what was wrong with the man. At any rate, he has a spirit that leaves him ritually unclean and therefore not in right relationship with God. And not only that, this spirit seems to be very assertive, almost kind of belligerent, but Jesus does not back down. He silences the spirit and he dismisses the spirit and it says that the spirit put up a fight, but that it left the man. Thomas Troger, who was a professor at Iliff Seminary says that when he served in the local church as a pastor that back then one time he went to see the movie The Exorcist. He said 
people were lined up around the theaters to see this movie. And of course, he said, my church members came to me afterward and they said, what did you think about this movie? Because it has to do with spiritual things, with supernatural uh, things that happened. And, and this is what he said. He said, you know, I noticed that in the movie, almost all of the characters that were good were really good, and all of the ones that were bad were really evil. And he said, I know that in the world, those two things are actually a little bit closer to one another. He said, every time I'm watching the, the news, and this would be back back then, and they start talking about a serial killer, and then they say that they're going to flash up a picture of this person. He said, I'm always looking for somebody that's really scary looking with fangs. And he said, whenever they put this person's face up there, they look a lot like me. The point that he is trying to make here is that evil is all around us. And the point that I think Jesus is trying to make about the authority of the Word of God, that is the very presence of the Word of God, is that even though evil is around us, when Christ is present, evil can be overcome. It can be defeated. And I think what Jesus is trying to do here is say it can be defeated with love. And we can do that by the authority of the Bible. Faye Angus tells a story about two friends with the Wycliffe Society that did a tour of Russia. They visited many different churches, went and spoke and heard others speak, and basically had a kind of a inter-dialogue with other Christians in that area. And when they, they got home, uh, she got together with these friends and said, you know, tell me all about it. And this friend said, well, one of the highlights of the trip was one day when we were all sitting around and we were trying to figure out a word for how God feels about us. She says, I know that the ancient Hebrews have a word hesed, which means a constant love with no breaks. And then, of course, Jesus used the word agape, and that has a very similar meaning. But we were sitting around talking about this, and all of a sudden, somebody said, abya. We said, what, what does that mean? Said abya, which means to see the good in someone. And folks, I think that's what Jesus does as an illustration of the presence or the authority of the Word of God in our midst. Notice that he does not defeat or injure or hurt the man. He calls the spirit out of him. I think because he can see the good that's in him. Maybe the child of God that is in him. And folks, I've thought about this a lot because it seems like whenever we start talking about the Word of God, we always think about defeating one another. You know, in the scriptures, it says that the Bible is like a two-edged sword. And I think many times we as Christians think that our purpose with the presence of God that is with us in the Holy Spirit, but also in the scriptures, that that, that belief, that faith, that that, that presence that God has with us is supposed to defeat other people. I will never forget during the disaffiliation process how many times I would witness people and they would do something hateful to others or say something that was hateful to others. And it was almost as if they were justifying it by saying, I'm right. I know the Word of God. I know what is right, and this is where I come down. This is what I have come to believe. And folks, I don't have any problem with a person having convictions and being up front and clear about how they believe and how they feel God might be leading them. But to me, when you're talking about the Bible as a sword, you're not talking about something that defeats other people. But instead, you're talking about something which is challenging. It has a sharp edge to it. It's powerful, but it's also something that cuts through our selfishness and our pride and our hatred so that we can share the love of Jesus Christ with others. And folks, that's our greatest authority. 
Because you see, it's one thing to say that the Bible is the authority of our lives, but it's another thing when I can say and live like it's my authority. This is how I know what I know. This is why I act the way I act. This is why I live the way I live. Because the authority of the Bible calls me to do so. And folks, I've come to believe that that's yet another way, and a powerful way, that the Word has become flesh, that God works in our lives in in our world to bring redemption. Would you pray with me? O oh God, let the Word of God be the authority, not only of what we say, but how we live our lives. Amen. O Word of God incarnate, O wisdom from on high, O truth unchanged, unchanging, O light of our dark sky. That from the hallowed page a lantern to our footsteps shines on from age to age. The church from you, our Savior, received the gift divine, and still that light is lifted o'er all the to shine. It is the sacred vessel where gems of truth are stored. It is the hand-drawn picture of Christ the living Word. Oh, make your church, dear Savior, a lamp of purest before the nations your true light as of old. Oh, teach your wandering pilgrims by this their path to trace till clouds and darkness ended they see Friends, thank you for worshiping with us today. As always, I invite you to go down with your um, phone uh, on camera mode to the lower right-hand corner. Put your um, phone over the QR code, follow the link to the registration page. We would love to know that you are visiting with us and watching and worshiping with us today. Um, as always, leaving your contact information is optional. There are opportunities there to serve, opportunities there to lift up person's names for prayer, and opportunities there to give. Um, we have now completed our six uh, missions um, that are all around our conference. If you still want to send in an offering, it would be very much appreciated, and I thank you for those of you who have given such wonderful and gracious uh, gifts to us. There's a couple of announcements that I want to share with you. First of all, um, as you remember, the Martin Luther King community-wide service was postponed. It's going to happen next Sunday on February the 4th at 4 o'clock. It will still be at the Quail United Methodist Church, and we thank them for hosting that service. Um, the woman that is coming to speak that day, deliver the message, is Dr. Candace Lewis. She is the president of Gammon Theological Seminary. If you can come and join us for that service, I know you will enjoy it very much. Um, but you may also want to just go online if you're not able to come and find that link that will connect you and you can worship with us that way as well. Um, 
The next thing is, is that um, I wanted to do kind of a, a sermon series for the season of Lent. And I came across an old book called The Celebration of Discipline by Richard Foster. Many of you may have read this or done a study like this in your church, and it may have even been a long time ago. But I got to looking at the disciplines of our faith, and I thought, what a great way for us to learn a little bit more about how God would, how we can make our journey, how God would want us to make that journey. And so I've decided that I'm going to pick several of those disciplines. If you want to reread that book or read it as I, as I follow along, and um, I'm actually gonna, not going to wait till the start of Lent. I'm going to, I'm going to start next Sunday with the discipline of meditation. If you want to read in his book, the beginning part, and read that chapter, I invite you to do so. And I hope that this journey will help us um, do what we actually are supposed to do during Lent, and that is to grow deeper with God, find those cutting edges where we need to grow a little bit more. So I hope that this will be helpful to you, and I invite you to to join us uh, beginning next week as we talk about the disciplines of our faith. Now I invite you to uh, receive this benediction. And now may the peace of God be with you. May the love of God both strengthen you and sustain you. And may the fellowship of God's Holy Spirit keep us together forever and ever. Amen.